What is going on everyone? In today's video, we're going to put together an extremely compact PC. I'm gonna show you step-by-step step how to do it. Now, I've, I've reserved a dedicated video for this because it takes a special finesse to build a system as compact as this. Uh, and uh, I can already tell you right now, we're gonna use an AMD APU, uh, but we're also gonna be dealing with a very, very small, sort of unconventional power supply in this space. So the AC adapter is actually gonna be external, so we'll have a power brick, but we'll also have uh, a separate board inside the case that's gonna run next to our ITX motherboard that we'll have to deal with. And I don't know how we're gonna fit all these cables in here, but I'm gonna show you some tips uh, to make this process a bit easier. And of course, I'll run through the typical how to build uh, process so you know exactly what to do from start to finish. So let's get started. So these are all the components you're gonna wanna buy. You don't have to buy the exact parts that I have here, but you're gonna wanna follow a similar format if you want something this small. Starting first with the case, I think you should in this case build, uh, you know, pick your parts around a case like this because you're gonna need to pick a, a board that'll fit in this. You'll also need to pick a CPU cooler that will fit in this case because the clearance height-wise is not uh, very tolerable. You're also gonna need to pick a drive that will fit in here. Obviously this tiny little case here, which we'll talk about more in a second, is not gonna support a hard disk drive of any sort. So only two and a half inch SSDs or M.2s, uh, any kind of like uh, PCIe based uh, NVMe drive or even a SATA M.2 like this will do. Uh, so these are the parts again, just wanna give you a brief summary of what we're gonna be working with. Uh, you're also going to need a Phillips head screwdriver. It's really about it. You don't need anything else. You can kind of get by with just uh, that tool there. And uh, also you're gonna have a bag of, of screws and maybe even zip ties and stuff that come with your case. I just like to collect all of them. Uh, so you'll see me periodically reaching out of here for some screws, but you should have all that included in the case when you buy it. So let's get started. Let's start first with our motherboard in today's build guide. We're gonna use the MSI B350i, which stands for ITX, and then Pro AC, the AC standing for built-in Wi-Fi support. Now, I think for smaller cases like this, having onboard Wi-Fi is kind of a necessity uh, because this might not be hooked up to a LAN cable if it's sitting in your living room, if you're using it as like an HTPC, uh, or even if it's mounted to uh, the back of a monitor or something something like that, which we can do with our Antec case. So it's important we have the ITX form factor, and in my opinion, Wi-Fi is also a plus. So we're gonna pull out the board, placing it on top of the box. This will act as our makeshift workbench. We're not worried about this cutting into uh, the box. The solder points on the bottom of the board can be a bit sharp, and we don't wanna work directly on our table surface because we could scratch things. Other than that, it really doesn't matter where you work as long as the system's not running and you're not I don't know, using a, a metal table or something like that. So this is our ITX board. This is where we're gonna install the CPU. This is where we're gonna install the RAM. These retention clips, we can kinda, we can go ahead and remove these because uh, our cooler we're gonna use, which is a stock Ryzen Wraith Stealth cooler, uh, will not require these clips. So first thing we're gonna do, take our Phillips head screwdriver and remove these four Phillips screws. I recommend saving these, put these in either your CP box or back in your motherboard box because you might at some point need these. Now, most older AMD coolers will use these clips, uh, but a lot of the newer coolers won't require it. You will likely need to use the back plate though. This will have a small little standoff sticking through and this is where you're going to screw in the new cooler. So keep this back plate, that's this piece right here, uh, underneath the motherboard. Now our CPU cooler by default, remember, will not fit in our Antec case. So what I had to do was remove the plastic outer ring uh, that has the AMD logo on it. I have more info in the video description of how to remove this. Uh, depending on the CPU cooler you use, you might have to modify it just a little bit. In our case, we had to, uh, but I wanted to get that out of the way up front before we install the CPU so you know exactly how we got this to fit in our build. Now we're going to install our CPU. So go ahead and slide that out of its box. You see this is just a chunk of silicon and metal. Most of the metal you're seeing here is the IHS. This is designed to spread heat across a, a larger surface area than the die underneath. Most of these chips are soldered so you won't find too many direct die solutions. Uh, now the key thing you're gonna wanna pay attention to is this golden arrow. If you align this golden arrow with the arrow on the socket, which you can see right here, it's a little indention, another triangle, you're gonna want those two to match up. So this is the orientation of the CPU. You can see if I can get the reflections just right, you can see the Ryzen word is facing this direction, right, toward our rear IO. It might differ from board to board, but in this case, this is the orientation we're gonna to wanna to drop the CPU into the socket. So what you can do first is lift this metal lever, pull out and then up. 
It'll stand straight up, take the CPU, align that golden arrow with the triangle on the socket, drop the CPU into place very gently. You might have to slide it around just a little bit to get those pins on the CPU to slide into the socket. There we go. Once it's all the way down, the silicon practically makes contact with the socket. You can re-secure the CPU by sliding this lever down. You might feel a bit of tension there and then snap it underneath and you're good to go. You just installed a CPU. Next up, we're gonna to wanna to install the CPU cooler. Now, depending on the cooler you're using, again, you might have pre-applied thermal paste. I've already removed it in this case, so there's none applied, but if you want to use stock compound, it's, there's no issue there. It's not gonna be the best quality. You might have slightly higher temps, but in general, it's acceptable to use that. And all you have to do is just sandwich this on top of the CPU, align the screws on both the bottom and top over those little pins sticking through the board, and then you can screw them in with your Phillips screwdriver. In our case, we we don't have any pre-applied thermal compound anymore, so I'm going to use Thermal Grizzly's Cryonaut solution. This is high quality thermal compound, and we're going to apply it like so. I suggest with Ryzen CPUs, a slightly longer line from top to bottom, just as I've done. A little more isn't gonna hurt. You just don't want this running over. It just gets messy. It's not conductive, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, but you don't wanna put too little that the this paste itself doesn't cover the entire IHS because heat will spread across this entire metal plate. So that's why I put a little more than uh, you might be comfortable with. And then we're going to sandwich the CPU cooler atop, align those screws with the pins running through the board that secures it to the back plate. Then we're gonna take our Phillips screwdriver and start twisting. Now at this point, your board might be flexing just a little bit on account of all that torque we've got in this cooler. Uh, it will bend the board slightly and that's okay. These boards are designed to be somewhat flexible, but you don't want it, of course, like, you know, doing some weird U shape. That would be an issue. I probably wouldn't torque the cooler that hard. But as is, we're fine. Now we have this cable here. This is a four pin PWM controlled fan cable. We're gonna wanna connect this to one of our CPU fan headers. We do have two up top here. And uh, it really doesn't matter which one you pick. Some boards won't even let you boot. They won't even, you know, Oh, well, they'll post, but they uh, won't let you boot into your operating system unless you have uh, a fan cable connected to the prime CPU fan header. In this case, I'm pretty sure with MSI, it doesn't matter. We're gonna plug ours into the CPU fan one header. So we'll take the cable like so. It's keyed to one side, so you can't really install this backwards. We have this extra slack here, and we could do any number of things with this. It really doesn't matter. Uh, as long as it's not blocking something else that we uh, need to access on the board, we'll be fine. Next up is RAM installation. Now, I must confess, this system is actually going to my wife's mother, and she is uh, she's not an avid gamer or anything like that. So eight gigs is gonna be enough for her. And in this case, you'd really wanna go with dual channel memory. Using an APU, it's gonna benefit you quite a bit. You're gonna want fast RAM as well, uh, but she's not going to be stressing the system at all. So that's why we're going with a single DIMM. But in most cases, for a build like this, you're gonna wanna go with two sticks. Even if it's two four gig sticks, that's okay, uh, because you're gonna have dual channel support and that will benefit you uh, to a pretty decent extent with respect to these APUs. In our case, again, it doesn't matter, so we're just going to install a single DIMM. And if you look right here on the board, you can see it says DIMM A1 and DIMM B1. A and B are two different channels, that's why this board supports dual channel memory, uh, but we're only gonna install one, and the optimal place here is a1, obviously A comes before B, install A first. There is a notch on the module, mind the notch. There is a small little indention here on the socket. You can see it right there. Once we have this notch aligned with the indention in the slot, we can slide the module into place. This will require some force here. Take two thumbs, one on each side, push down on one side first till you hear a click. Just like that. Now, holding that thumb still in place, push down with the other thumb until you hear another click. There you go. So now our module is installed. What you could do is turn it sideways, see if the module is kind of sitting crooked. Uh, if you can see a lot of the copper exposed and it's probably not seated correctly. In our case, it looks good. If it doesn't post, this would be one of the first things I would try. Maybe remove this module, move it to the other dim slot, uh, or just make sure that it's pushed in all the way. Modules are a, a, a very frequent cause of failed posts. You know, PCs just won't boot up at all. 
probably because one of these modules is installed correctly. Now, this right here is our entire system practically. We just need power and we need a uh, storage drive of sorts. So what we're going to do next is install our M.2 SSD. Now this is actually a fast SSD. And the only reason why I'm including it in this budget build is because I got this for a really great deal on Newegg. These are going for around a hundred bucks each. Uh, so I bought two of these and they're 480 gig drives, which is I think plenty for a budget build. Also extremely fast. These are Gen 3 by 4 four lane NVMe SSDs. So we're gonna get insanely fast reads and writes. Our system's gonna boot up very fast uh, and we'll be able to load games and anything else on this drive in a snap. So if you want an ultra fast computer for just day to day tasks, I highly recommend an M.2 SSD, uh, particularly an NVMe one because you're gonna use a different uh, interface and it will be significantly faster than SATA. More on that in, uh, I don't know which side the video is gonna be on, one of these sides. So we're gonna wanna pull this drive out and you can see it is extremely small. There isn't much to it. It does not come with a heat sink of any sort. So if we had a heat sink available, we could put that on top of this. Well, actually it does come with a very small one, but it's not gonna do much. Uh, so I, I don't think in this case it's gonna matter. We'll go ahead and slide it on just for good measure, but it, it really won't make much of a difference. Uh, I can see most of the chips are on this side. So we're going to install it like so. Make sure we don't cover the cutout for the screw. Now, where does this go? Where do we install this? There's no slot anywhere here. What do we, where do we push it, right? It's actually on the back of this board. It will depend on the board. You can refer to your manual if you are a bit confused, uh, but you can see we do have an M.2 port right here and we have the screw pre-installed. This is what we're gonna use to lock it in place. So. Your big Phillips head screwdriver might not work in this application. If you have a smaller one, I recommend you start with that. Otherwise, you'll probably strip this uh, tiny little Phillips screw here. You can see there is a key in this port. On one side, there's a very small area for a few connections, and the other side is much bigger. And you can see the M.2 drive follows the same suit, right? So a very small key off to one side. So we're gonna align it like so. Uh, in this case, we're going to, whoops, backwards. Slide it in just like this toward the top of the connector. It'll snap all the way in. You shouldn't see any exposed copper. We're gonna push this down about as far as we can and then we're going to secure the M.2 drive with the removed Phillips screw. Another thing to be careful of, there are actually two screws that go into this hole and the first one you're gonna to wanna to keep installed before you install the drive. So I actually messed that up myself when I was installing this the first time. I realized that when I unscrewed this, I actually took out both ends. You just wanna remove the thin Phillips screw uh, that sits on top of this plate. The reason why you wanna keep this in is because you don't want this making contact with anything else on the back of the board, uh, just for good measure. We don't really have anything insulating this side other than a sticker. So uh, just mind that. You can see now when we install it, the M.2 drive is not touching anything under the board. Kind of see there. It looks like it is, but it's, it's not. It's much better now than it was before. We can take this tiny little Phillips screw and we're going to seat it like so. There we go. Our drive is secure and again, the only thing we have left to do is install this into our case and then set up our power supply, our wiring, which will be difficult to do and we'll be ready to boot. Now to prep our case, what I suggest you do is remove both the left and right panels, move the cables out of the way as, as much as possible without snagging them and, and tearing them. Uh, mind the standoffs. You can see these little gold standoffs here. There's gonna be four in total for an ITX board and you're gonna want to uh, line these standoffs off with the four holes on the motherboard, which I'll show you in a second. But uh, the other thing you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to is the rear IO cutout. That's this large rectangular cutout here on the back of the case. You're going to want to remove your motherboard's I.O. shield from the box. It'll look something like this. And you'll notice there are pins that stick out on one side. These are designed to press against the rear I.O. ports on the motherboard. So you want these pins, you can see them how they stick out here. You're gonna want these facing inward. So the smooth side is facing outward, right? So we're gonna wanna install it like so the other thing to keep in mind is orientation. So you could really put this in this way or this way, either way will work, but your motherboard has its layout designed a specific way. So when it's facing out, when the rear IO is facing 
out like this. You wanna pay attention to where these uh, ports are. These are the microphone headphone jacks. Wherever this is, your AC Wi-Fi is right next to that, you're gonna make sure that you align the rear I.O., the orientation that you insert this so that this fits into this, right? So now we're gonna slide this through and you're gonna to wanna to press on it. It's gonna be a bit frustrating depending on the case. You push one side in, the other side pops out. That's kind of how these work. This is frustrating, but there we go, I already did it. So you do it enough times uh, and uh, you, you get used to it. So the more you practice, this will get easier. So there we go, rear IO is installed. And then now we can thread our motherboard into place using the rear IO as a reference, as well as the standoffs that I talked about earlier. You can see there's a standoff right, everything's mirrored on the screen, right? Right there, that's one of our standoffs. So when we install the motherboard, Keep, <laughs> be careful of these cables, especially in this case. This is why I'm making a dedicated video for this, uh, this PC build here. Uh, I think what I'm gonna try to do is slide it, um, you know, front side in first, kind of push it to the back, if that's possible. Is it possible? Got a lot of cables preventing us from going straight in like that. Okay, let's try going in from right to left. Make sure none of these cables get stuck behind the motherboard when you finally install it, by the way. Okay, so I finally got it. I kind of pushed the board in like so, kind of pushing the rear I.O. into place first. And uh, now what we're gonna wanna do is secure the motherboard to the chassis with four included screws. I will get four of those and show you what they look like. So they kind of look like this and they have little discs wrapped around them. Almost looks like pre-installed washers of sorts. You're gonna wanna use four of these and uh, screw those into the standoffs on the four corners of the motherboard. Those are those gold things I was pointing to earlier. All right, so board is secured to the chassis. That was actually kind of easy. Antec gave us these convenient little uh, you know, hemispherical cutouts here that make it much easier to uh, slide a Phillips screwdriver into uh, the tight spaces it needs to fit. So now we have all these cables and these cables are going to be the bulk of the remaining uh, portion of this video, getting these into their correct places. So a uh, quick rule on cable management, what I like to do is start with the smallest cables first because it's very difficult to work around these thicker cables or the, you know these uh, <laughs> kind of like angel hair slews of cables, especially the 24 pin and the 8 pin EPS. Uh, so start with the smaller cables first, you can kind of squish those down with the larger cables as you progress through the wiring section of your build. So we have a power switch, we have a hard drive LED, we have power LED, positive and negative, and I think that's it. So no dedicated reset switch, not a big deal for this chassis here. But we're going to want to pay attention to these wires. We want to make sure we plug these into the correct headers on the board. Now in our case, the front IO header on the motherboard is right here. You'll see it usually denoted as JFP1, and this right here is the correct pinout for front IO connections. So make sure that you abide by this key when you're installing the cables that I just showed you. Otherwise, you could fry an LED or uh, your system might not power on at all because you wired it incorrectly. Another quick pro tip, if the positive and negative terminals are not listed on the plastic little shroud for these connectors, what you can do is reference the small little arrow that points toward the terminating point of of this clip. If that arrow is on one side, let's say it's on the left side, then the left side is the positive terminal. That means the opposite side, the right side, is the negative terminal. And with the front IO connections, the positive port is almost always the left pin, so the one that's closest to uh, the rear IO of your motherboard. Just a, a rule of thumb, not always the case, but it, it could help if you're in a tough spot. So that there was our hard drive LED. I'm gonna kind of tuck that cable around the perimeter of the motherboard. Next, we will do the power switch. In this case, polarity doesn't matter. You're just completing a circuit with this switch, so uh, you don't really need to pay attention to which side is uh, the positive side. Lastly, our power LED positive and negative wires. That'll do. Okay, next smallest wire is HD audio, and it will typically be denoted as such. You can see there, HD audio. And that port is going to be 
typically very close to rear I.O. as far down as possible. With ITX it can get a little weird, but you'll see usually on the board uh, a label that says something along the lines of HD audio. It is keyed a certain way by the way, so there's only one way to install this. Don't worry about installing it upside down, just mind the key. Okay, HD audio is installed and you can see those wires have kind of tucked against the chassis, sort of underneath the motherboard. These are all insulated wires, so you're not gonna worry about anything short circuiting or anything like that. Uh, but I have just uh, tucked those in and run those along the perimeter of the motherboard. You just don't want these small cables kind of just, you know, free hanging anywhere because they could get caught by the fan. This is really the only moving part of the system. Uh, but the cleaner the better and it makes things easier in the future if you intend to work on this case, maybe upgrade it uh, or something along those lines. Our next smallest cable is is USB 2.0 and this is key to certain way as well as you can see the bottom left or the top right depending on your orientation uh, that is the keyed slot and you'll typically see this denoted on the board as such USB 2.0 you can see in our board it just says USB and it's actually written into uh, the header itself so you just have to pay attention to that this is not USB 3 USB 3 uses this port which is much different, so you're not really gonna confuse the two unless you just do this blindfolded. Next up is USB 3. That's this connector right here. These are pretty difficult to work with. The cables are rather thick. We do have two USB 3 ports in this case, so that's why there are two wires kind of conjoined at the head. And the USB 3 port is uh, basically what I just showed you. It's this longer kind of port here. And there are many more pins than there are with USB 2.0. This is probably also gonna be labeled on the motherboard. Now the last cables to worry about are power for the motherboard CPU and our drives. We have the 24 pin which powers the motherboard and to an extent peripherals. We have the 8 pin EPS. This could be a four pin depending on the board and the platform that you choose. This powers the CPU directly. Then we have our SATA connectors. You have uh, actually SATA here which is this is a SATA power cable and then you have Molex which is this small little four pin power connector. This is more old school uh, but you still might see some hard drives and other peripherals powered via this interface. In our case, we have neither external SSDs, hard drives, or anything else powered by uh, Molex, so we don't need to worry about these. We can leave them as is, kind of tuck them somewhere where they're not in the way of the other two cables. We can tackle the 8-pin EPS next. The port for this is typically located near the upper left section of the motherboard, which if you're looking at it like so, upper left is here, and you can see there's the 8-pin. Uh, that right there is for the CPU, so all CPU power for the most part comes through this port and we're going to mind the clip. If you see a little lip on the port, uh, that lip is the same side that you're gonna see these little uh, little levers. So make sure that you plug it in like that. Again, we're gonna cable manage as we go, kind of tuck these cables around the perimeter of the board. And last, we have the 24 pin. Uh, this is going to power, again, our motherboard and to an extent peripherals. Same thing, you have a clip on one side, you'll find a lip on the connection point as well on just one side, and uh, that's the side you're gonna wanna align this clip with. You'll know this is properly secured when there is no gap uh, between the connection on the board and the physical connector uh, into which the wires run. Okay, things look good, and I'm just gonna kinda figure out where to tuck these remaining cables. And yeah, I think we'll just have to call it a day. <laughs> so uh, next thing we're gonna do is put our left side panel on. Now you can see this is mesh and I'll show you how close. I mean, there's literally no clearance at all between the top of the CPU cooler and the mesh. Luckily, Antec uh, indented this just enough to where a Wraith Stealth cooler with the removed plastic cover fits perfectly. You can start by securing the front of this panel first and then you can push down on the back side. And you'll hear a few snaps. You can see we actually had a dedicated tray here for SSDs, for uh, SATA two and a half inch SSDs. So if you had a couple of those, you could uh, secure those to this bracket. Four Phillips screws hold this bracket in place and it just sits under the motherboard very discreetly. Clip that in first. And then the back snaps in. There's nothing really back here pressing against it, so that was fairly easy. And then we also have four Phillips screws uh, on the back next to the rear I.O. plate that we'll need to secure in order to keep these panels in place. And there we go. That is the entire system. And uh, this is smaller than most consoles on the market. And uh, it's not gonna be 
I don't know, we'll have to run our tests. The 2200G is not a very powerful APU. I mean, it's more powerful than something we had maybe in 2013 with the Kaveri chips, but uh, it's not going to replace a discrete card. Most discrete cards will outperform this APU by a long shot. That said though, there's a lot of power still packed into such a small footprint. Antec actually did a really great job with this case. All right, now at this point, we have the case sitting nice and snug on the included stand, and we do have the AC power adapter to worry about now. So if you wanna power this up, we're going to want to plug this part, uh, this end obviously into the wall, and then the other end into the brick. And then from the brick, we have this very small connection uh, that we'll make with the uh, back of the case. So this is gonna be similar to like a laptop, uh, and that's just uh, one, I guess, downside of going with a smaller compact case like this. We can't fit an entire power supply in here, and that's why we have the external AC adapter included. Now let's see if this thing powers on. Uh, okay, that didn't work. That's weird, the power brick works. I can see the light on the brick, so it's probably something wire-wise that was either removed or that was neglected. So uh, yeah, I've tried straight up jumping the motherboard. Uh, that didn't work. I think what I'm going to have to do now, I mean, all these connections, these are all solid connections in here. I checked 24, 8 pin EPS, CPU, fan, cable, all that stuff's in there. I think what I'm gonna do is bypass this small little power supply bit and uh, just run an external power supply and see if I can get this power up. And if it does, then that means that the little Pico whatever format power supply is in here uh, just isn't working. I know the brick's working because the brick is on. Uh, it's lighting up. So that means that uh, something in here is not properly delivering power to the motherboard. That is a shame. Okay, power supply on. This button's not gonna work because I removed the front connector. So let's just jump it. There we go. System, I'm assuming it's posting. I mean, we actually get lights on the motherboard and the fans turning, so. That means we likely have a dead power supply, which means we were one of the people hit with the uh, dead PSU plague upon arrival. Well, I guess I better call Antec. I'm gonna unscrew this board, this uh, little Pico, I still don't know if it's a Pico power supply, but it's just a small little board in here that I'm going to remove and see if I can see any defects. I didn't say this earlier in the video because I didn't really think it mattered. I thought this would still work. Uh, but one of the screws on this small little power supply board was dislodged. It was just completely removed actually. And it was kind of flopping all over the place when it arrived. So maybe, maybe something happened to it during transport. Not sure. Let's see if there are any defects. I want to be careful with this because I don't know if current was actually running through any section of this. But there might be some diode or inductor, or something that's not making proper contact. Yeah, so we have a system that can't boot with its own native power supply because it is dead. And hey, at least you learn how to build the system. I was going to also show you how to install Windows and kind of include that all in the same tutorial, but I do already have a video talking about that. You can check it out one of these sides here. Uh, so I will uh, direct you to that if you are wanting to know how to install software, an operating system or other software, but uh, maybe I can get them to send me just a replacement board that they've tested in house beforehand. And then I can send this with Lisa back home to Germany so her mom can enjoy a very fast PC. Maybe not the best for gaming, obviously, but fast in terms of uh, reads and writes. We have a really fast drive in here. And I mean, come on, it's an APU in 2019. The APU came out, what, last year? Uh, it's really good for what it is, really good for the money, and so is this board with built-in Wi-Fi and the works. If you guys like this video, thumbs up, you know what to do. I'm sorry, I, it's just kind of one big failure there at the end, but uh, hey, you know how to build a PC now, so there's that. Wow, this, this went horribly wrong. <laughs> Click that subscribe button if you haven't already. Hopefully we don't have power supplies failing us in the future. Stay tuned for more content, hopefully not like this. This is Science Studio, thanks for watching, and thanks for learning with us.